All right, Ephesians 5 again tonight. Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, we've sort of been bogged down in this one section right here for a little bit. And uh, so I want to... Hopefully we'll finish this section tonight. Uh, but let me go back and just read the section again. And then we'll briefly say a few things that we've already said, and we'll get right into new uh, material. Uh, verse 3, But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret, but all things that are approved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore, he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee uh, uh, Christ shall give thee light. And um, so we we're looking at this section, and and um, I said it's one of the most comprehensive sections on what in all the Bible. Anybody remember? It's one of my favorite themes in the Bible. Separation. Separation. Um, and, and again, folks, I didn't pick this section to, to just so I could preach on separation. It's just in the, in the flow of, of Ephesians 5. And when all these things down through here, all these horrible things that Paul's speaking about, not to, don't even let it be once named about, uh, among you. Uh, he, he's speaking to the child of God here. He's not warning the outside world. He's telling Christians don't have anything to do with this. And um, it's a contrast between those that are lost and those that are saved. The children of the dark and the children of the light. And, um, and so we were, uh, we've been going over these things rather extensively and um, uh, uh, we ended up uh, last week, uh, we were talking about um, uh, this exhortation against immorality protects against deception. Let no man deceive you with vain words, was Paul's warning here. Uh, Folks, look at, you can be deceived. That's why it's so important to know what the Bible says. Listen, if we know what the Bible says and we know how to apply the Bible, we won't be deceived. But there are those out there that are deceivers. And listen, some of the cults that are around, and uh, I call them cults, they're, they're false teachings. They get a lot of their converts out of Baptist churches because God's people don't know the truth. And they'll say some things. They'll, they'll sprinkle a little bit of truth in with a lot of error. And uh, pretty soon they're, they're drawn away. And so uh, let no man deceive you with vain words. Uh, because of these things cometh the wrath of God. And uh, my goodness, uh, what a warning there. Uh, but uh, be not ye therefore partakers with them in verse 7 was um, was the um, admonition there. And then 
we said last week as we were ending, I won't go back and touch this again. Biblical separation requires requires a testing mind set. He says in verses uh, 9 through 10, prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. Prove it. Um, you ever question what's acceptable to God or not? Uh, but you can prove what is. You don't have to guess. You can get in the Bible. Listen, you study the Bible and the Spirit of God, He'll teach you. He'll show you right from wrong. That won't be your problem. But prove what is acceptable to the Lord. That word proving there means to try, to discern, to distinguish, approve, proving a thing whether it is worthy <coughs> excuse me, or not. Folks, there, there are just some things that for the child of God we should not be uh, part of. It's an essential part of the Christian life, the Christian ministry. I gave you several verses last night, uh, last week, Acts 17, 11, Romans 12, 2, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, Philippians 1, 10, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 21. Uh, listen, if we, that, that's... Uh, Proving what is good and what is evil, uh, what is the will of God, that, that's a protection for you and me as God's children. It's a pathway of safety. It's the pathway to the will of God in our life. Every one of us all want to know what the will of God for our life is. Test everything, folks, by the will of God. You go home tonight, you hear something uh, tonight, go home and test it by the Word of God and see if it's true or not. Uh, uh, verse 10, look at what it says, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Don't prove what's acceptable, acceptable to me or anybody else. Prove what's acceptable to the Lord. And you'll, you'll do this with the Word of God. And... Uh, uh, that's how you prove what is acceptable to the Lord. Uh, I said last week, that's the only thing. Listen, what's acceptable to the Lord is the only thing that matters in the Christian life. The only thing that matters. Uh, you guys know my testimony with my health. And the day I sat in that doctor's office and he told me, he said, look at you. You're pretty sick. You may not have long to live, very short time. And I'll tell you, the only thing that mattered to me in that moment was my relationship with Jesus Christ. That was the main thing. Now, I thought about my wife, my children, and, you know, what's going to happen to them. But when it got down to the end, listen, are you right? with the Lord? Are you living with Him? Are you living for Him? Uh, is, is, is the only thing that's going to matter in the end. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's acceptable in the eyes of man or not. Is it acceptable in God's eyes? It has to be acceptable to the Lord. Uh, does it please my Lord? If I'm involved in something, can we look at it and say, is this pleasing to God in my life? My Lord, my Master, uh, we ought to test it whether it's light or darkness in verse 8. Therefore, uh, for you were sometimes darkness, but now are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Um, uh, if it's of the dark, it's to be rejected. Um, I mean, there, there are a lot of things that represent darkness today, folks. And a lot of times we dress it up as so innocent. Some of the cartoon characters and things today that we allow our children to be involved with, it's just no, it's nothing more than just evil. Um, I was in my, our parking lot out here the other day, and uh, it, we all on board with this Pokemon stuff. It, it, it's it's not of God, right? It's it's of the dark side. We've talked about it before. Uh, and it used to be a lot more um, popular than it is now. But I was out here in the parking lot the other day, and this little kid, 
I be, must have been five years old, maybe six. And that, I don't know what she was chanting or or some kind of gibberish that was coming out of her mouth. But ever so long, ever so often, I, I wouldn't understand what she's saying. And then she'd say, Pokemon. And then she'd go again, Pokemon. Pokemon. I thought, what? My goodness. And, and you think that that's just, oh, that's nothing. That's just make-believe. Well, you believe that if you want to, but don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. So uh, test it. Uh, if it's darkness, it's to be rejected. It's to be avoided. It's to be reproved. Don't have anything to do with it. Uh, it should be tested by the fruit of the Spirit, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. There's the test. Is it good? Is it righteous? Is it truth? And so that's the way it's to be tested. If it's not good, righteous, and truth, it's wrong. If it's wrong, it should be forbidden to the child of God. Well, God don't give us a lot of wiggle room, does He? Um, it's either right or it's wrong. And there's not a lot of gray area there. Uh, and, and again, the standard for right and wrong is what? The Bible. It's the Word of God. Every time the standard for right and wrong is going to be the Word of God. Standard of right and wrong is not going to be me, folks. It's not going to be some other TV evangelist, some other preacher somewhere, some, somebody you know that you trust a lot. The standard of right and wrong is always going to be the Word of God. Now, if I give you the Word of God, then, you know, I, but that standard's not me. It's still the Word of God. It'll always be that. Uh, and so everything needs to be tested by the Bible. Um, and, we're, we're, and we're talking about proving what's right and wrong. Uh, that, that's what we're talking about here. Um, what is acceptable, proving what is acceptable to the Lord. If it's contrary to God's Word, it's the doctrine of devils and not of the Spirit of God. Proving is present tense. The, the tense of that verb is present tense. So uh, the idea of present tense is it just you just keep it and there's never time when you don't do it. It's a continual action. Uh, it, and the, that tense matters. So well, I proved something 10 years ago. Well, you need to keep you just need to keep proving, keep proving. Uh, it, 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 the, the, the tense indicates, uh, it's the verb that God chose. Uh, continuous action. It ought to be a way of life. It ought to be our lifestyle that we prove what's right and wrong. Um, uh, it just, it, it, and folks, that's not judgmental, folks. We're trying to prove what's right and what's wrong, what's dark and what's light. And we judge everything by the Word of God, and that's good. That's what's good, what's righteous, and what's true. Uh, that ought to be our lifestyle. Uh, so what we're going to give you now is uh, we've not covered yet. Um, but verse 11, uh, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. No fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. How many times can God say, come apart from these things? And here he's telling us again, it's a strict path, folks. It's a strict path. No fellowship. How much fellowship? None. No fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Um, any of y'all out there thinking, man, you just ought to lighten up a little bit. <laughs> Not if you obey the Bible, right? I've, 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 I've been told, you just need to lighten up a little bit. <laughs> um, but that's not what the Bible says. Uh, this judge not philosophy 
Well, there's stuff. So there's some things we should judge, folks. Um, what's right and what's wrong, and we test it how by what? By the Bible. And so if we test it by the Bible, I mean, I'm not I'm not looking out at Jack and and pointing out all his flaws. That's not what I'm doing here. I need to point out my own flaws, take care of that. But but we're talking about things that are that are dark and things that are light. Uh, we should should not be partakers of these things. Um, the works of darkness. What are the works of darkness? Listen, folks, the works of darkness is everything contrary to what? The Bible. If it's contrary to the Bible, it's the work of darkness. And that's what the, uh, the Scripture is telling us here. Uh, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Um, the works of darkness are the works of evil, of sin, of unrighteousness. And we're not to have any part of it. Um, why do you think Paul called it the unfruitful works of darkness? Well, because they come from the dark world. They come from the world of Satan. The world of darkness, that's, that's where they come from. If it's not righteousness, it's darkness. And we're to have no fellowship with it. Um, a lot of time, but not always, you, you can tell if it's the unfruitful works of darkness because we try to do these things in the dark where nobody else can see it. That's a good indication. If, I, if there's something I'm out there doing, I don't want anybody else to know about it. That's a good chance that's probably the unfruitful works of darkness. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> um, Paul's speaking to those types of things. And again, who's he speaking to? Not speaking to the lost, the outside world. He's, he's writing this to a group of uh, Christians, a church. Is who he's writing this to. And so, um, and where does that usually originate at? It usually originates in our mind. We just. Listen, um, we don't, we just don't go do something stupid. I, well, I'm, I'm pretty good at doing stupid stuff. And uh, I was, I got a thing for, for hitting my head. I get in a low space. I was down there in this, closet down here across from the kitchen and if you go in there there's a low place and you you have to bend down so I'm bend down I'm not gonna hit my head today so I'm down there I'm and so I'm coming out of that thing and all right I'm out of it now and I'm BAM oh my god you stupid you know I had it in my mind I'm not gonna do so I'm thinking about it I should have stayed down a little bit longer and that's, but I'm just saying, the unfruitful works of darkness, folks, we think about them before we do them. We just don't go out and do it. It's a thought that enters into our mind. We meditate on it, and pretty soon we act on it. And, and so we need to be careful about that. We need to guard our minds, uh, what we allow ourselves to think on and meditate on. The unfruitful works, the works of darkness are unfruitful. They don't accomplish God's will. That's why they're called unfruitful. Uh, they don't have God's blessings. Uh, they don't have any good benefit. And uh, so have no fellowship with it is what Paul was saying then. Uh, 
Reprove the unfruitful works of darkness. Um, in verses 11 through 14. Um, reprove them in verse 11. Um, to reprove is to convince of error, to refute. Um, it's in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18 when it says you go to somebody and you tell them his fault. That's that same word. It comes from that same word to reprove. It means to tell somebody their fault. And so listen, folks, if we see somebody that's, you know, you ever want to say, won't you just mind your own business? <laughs> well, listen, sometimes I, I try to, when somebody tells me something uh, and I don't like what they're saying, a good thing to do, it may be true, it may not be true, but I like to ask myself, is there any truth about what this person is telling me? And it, it may be 99.9% false, but that one-tenth of a percent, there may be some truth in it. And so just don't, the next time somebody comes in to reprove you, uh, don't just, well, they don't know what they're talking about. Step back. Look at that thing. Is there any truth? It's what's being said here. Um, it means to rebuke, to convince of sin. Uh, and so there is a place for it. Now, listen, if you're going to reprove somebody of their sin, you better look at your own life first. You better see if there's any beans in your own eye before you come try to take the splinter out of somebody else's eye. And because that's part of it also. Uh, but I believe it's a necessary part of the gospel ministry. You go to Romans chapters 1 through 3. Paul spent a lot of time reproving sin, did he not? He did. Oh boy, I'm going to tell you what. Uh, get in there and read that a little bit. There's a lot of reproof there. Uh, it's part of the ministry. It's part of the gospel ministry. Uh, he spent three chapters reproving sin, showing man his guilt uh, before a holy God and the judgment that was to come. Uh, and, and it wasn't until after that that he preached the grace of Christ. He showed them their fault. He showed them their error, showed them where they're wrong, showed them their sin. And then he said, now, let me show you how to take care of it. And that was part of the gospel ministry. Uh, I think it's a necessary part of preaching. Um, but, well, folks, what, what do you think the goal of preaching should be? What do you think the goal of preaching ought to be? I get up here and preach a message or some other evangelist missionary, uh, they get up and preach a message. What is the goal of it? So we can get some, so we can get some knowledge and, oh, we, we've learned something new today? That, no. Now, that might be, that might happen, but that's not the goal. Listen, the goal of preaching, I believe God's purpose for preaching is for you and I to make a decision. A lot of churches don't have invitations anymore. Um, I've been told that it's that I'm a legalist because I invite people to come to an altar, which is not biblical. And well, I don't believe that's true. I believe the goal of preaching is to bring people to a, to a decision in their life. Hey, listen, folks. If the preaching of the Word of God rubs you wrong, then just turn around so it'll rub you right and you can get right. And um, the Bible will do that to you. The Word of God will do that. It'll reprove you. And we ought not chafe against it. Um, and then verse 13 and 14. But all things that are reproved, look at it, are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. 
Verse 14, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Listen, folks, we don't have to walk in darkness. We don't have to walk according to the unfruitful works of darkness. Separation from evil is very much a part of the Christian life. And that's a, we've spent quite a bit of time in that section. And hopefully next time we're together, uh, we'll pick up a new, new section of chapter five. But folks, just always step back. Is, is this pleasing? To, is, is what I'm doing, is it pleasing to the Lord? And if it's not, let's don't have any part of it.